Welcome to this webinar in the Silicon Web Customers Guild presents webinar series, Egyptomania, the impact of the discovery of ancient Egypt on popular culture with Leslie L. Johnston. The Silicon Web Customers Guild webinar series offers talks by speakers on a variety of topics about costumes and costuming. The webinars are free to Silicon Web members, and they may also be available to the greater costuming community on a space available basis. Send feedback or suggestions for future speakers or topics to board at siwcostumers.org with the subject line webinar series. The chapter acknowledges the International Costumers Guild, Marty Gear Costuming Arts and Sciences Fund for a grant award in support of developing this webinar series and the ICG for making its Zoom platform available to chapters and special interest groups. A few notes on Zoom. Please set or leave your video and audio controls on mute. Feel free to chat or react during the presentation in the chat window. There will be a Q&A period after the presentation. To ask a question, type it into the chat window, and you can optionally label it as Q&A. When the webinar is over, please complete a brief survey on your experience. We will use your feedback to help us improve future webinars. Following Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798, images of Egyptian archeological sites and artifacts were widely distributed throughout the illustrated press and widely popular Description de l'Egypte series of publications. This mania for all things ancient Egypt led to interpretations of its culture and iconography in fashion, art, music, and literature that were wildly varying in their degrees of authenticity. The discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922 launched a later wave of Egyptomania. Leslie L. Johnston will discuss how the illustrated and popular press helped create the Egyptomania craze in popular culture, and show images of clothing, architecture, art, and music influenced by ancient Egypt from the 1790s to the 1920s. Leslie Johnston has been costuming since the 1970s for fantasy and historical competitions and hall costumes. She's won many awards for masquerades, including at Balticon, Baycon, CostumeCon, Westercon and Wilcon. She loves to learn new techniques with every costume she builds and particularly enjoys working with unusual materials. Leslie is the vice president of the International Costumers Guild and the webmaster of the ICG Pat and Peggy Kennedy Memorial Archives. She's a member of the ICG New Jersey, New York Costumers Guild chapter and Miss Lizzie's Traveling Historical Fashion Show Special Interest Group. Leslie is the 2022 recipient of the ICG Lifetime Achievement Award. She also serves as the Director of Digital Preservation at the U.S. National Archives. So with that, Leslie, take it away. So Egyptomania is a term that a number of people probably here and others are familiar with. But the scope and scale of Egyptomania, or how the discovery of ancient Egypt and the dissemination of the um, depictions of ancient Egypt impacted popular culture, incredibly wide ranging, and as we said in the introduction, of wildly varying authenticity. So I'll go ahead and get started. So modern Egyptomania began with a war. So in 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte launched a Mediterranean campaign, which was a series of naval engagements that included the capture of Malta, the Greek island of Crete, but later arriving in the port of Alexandria in Egypt. Napoleon proclaimed that this action was meant to defend French trade interests and to establish scientific enterprise in the region. Uh, this resulted in a largely unsuccessful effort to gain the support of the Egyptian population, so because Bonaparte portrayed himself as a liberator of the people from the oppression of the Ottoman Empire that considered Egypt to be one of its processes. But thanks to the taxes he imposed to support his army, the Egyptians were unsurprisingly unconvinced of Napoleon's good intentions. 
So the British, Ottoman Turks, and Egyptian Mamluks were battling for French control of Egypt for several years on land and sea, each losing and gaining territory several times. It was at a bloody um, occupation and an uprising in Cairo in 1798, where the French slaughtered at least 5,000 people and tens of thousands of soldiers and civilians were killed in all the battles. Uh, 30,000 of them were French. So when Napoleon left Egypt, the commander of his army was assassinated in 1800, and the joint Anglo-Ottoman forces continued to besiege the French who were still there, finally formally defeating them in fall of 1801. The Treaty of Paris, which was signed in 1802, ended all the hostilities between France and the Ottoman Empire, returning Egypt to the Ottomans, which was also not entirely popular, but we won't go into that. So during the occupation, the French did indeed launch a major campaign of exploration and excavation. Napoleon really espoused the values of the Enlightenment, and he invited a large contingent of scholars, scientists, engineers, artists, known as the Commission de Science et l'Art d'Egypte, to accompany his French forces who were doing the occupying. Um, this contingent founded the Institut d'Egypte, um, launched the Decade Egyptienne scientific journal, as well as the Courrier de l'Egypte newspaper. They also built labs, libraries, set up the first printing press uh, that is known in Egypt, which was capable of printing um, French, Greek, and Arabic. And when the British defeated the French army, uh, General Menou, who was the leader of the forces, signed all the Egyptian antiquities over that they had collected over to the British. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But these early illustrated publications made ancient Egypt accessible to the world in a way they had never been before. So the collective research led to the publication of the four volume uh, memoir sur l'Egypte, uh, publié pendant la campagne de Général Bonaparte dans l'année 1798-1799, published between 1798 and 1801, as well as the comprehensive um, description de l'Egypte uh, that was published in 37 volumes between 1809 and 1929. So here is an example of some of the illustrations um, from those works. And in some ways, they are, in cases like in the upper right, a, um, a relatively accurate depiction of the uh, Great Temple at Philae and how it was seen now prior to uh, the excavation. But in other cases, it were these greatly sort of romanticized view you know, the colorized illustrations of what they assumed that ancient Egypt looked like. Um, so these are the sorts of illustrations that actually caught people's eye in terms of popular culture. Here are some others uh, that are the, um, from Thebes and Karnak, the Grand Temple at Dendur, uh, clothing that was discovered at Saqqara, uh, the different bas-reliefs at the Grand Temple, um, as well as these colorized illustrations that really, really you know, encouraged people to sort of take up the design that came with ancient Egypt. Um, the Sphinx, as it was discovered, whether they really did shoot the nose off um, is apocryphal, uh, but other views here, the Great Pyramids of mummies, of obelisks, and the Rosetta Stone, which was a hugely important scientific discovery for the translation of several ancient languages. So, the Victorians loved archaeological exploration, and when these illustrated volumes started coming out of Egypt after the French occupation, this really ignited the interest of the Victorians, especially the Victorian English, to actually undertake scientific, or scientific as per the uh, Victorian type, um, and they started Egypt. Egypt. Um, excavating at the Serapeum, at Saqqara, and that was Mariette's excavation in 1851. The pyramids were opened by Maspero in 1881, and the first scientific and systematic excavation 
of the Giza Plateau was begun by Flinders Petrie in 1880. And Flinders Petrie is a name that is well known to anyone who has studied archaeology or studied the history of archaeology, because he is really the founder of a lot of modern scientific archaeological techniques of excavation, going down in layers, using particular types of tools. I still have my number five pointing trowel from when I uh, was a graduate student in archaeology at UCLA, and Flinders Petrie was the first to introduce those techniques. So as the Victorians, especially the British, started to go in and begin these excavations, the illustrated travelogues also became very popular. So um, Napoleon's scholarly works, the groups of his, the works produced by his scholars were very well known, but David Roberts, who was a particularly skilled watercolorist, uh, published his sketches in Egypt and Nubia from 1846 to 1849. And Amelia Edwards, A Thousand Miles Up the Nile from 1877, introduced many to the Egypt at the time and the opportunities to actually view the monument monuments, such as from um, the view of traveling up and down the waters of the Nile. So at this point, we reach the age of the illustrated newspaper. So as I said before, the illustrated um, scientific publications came out um, after the opening of the pyramids at Saqqara in 1881. Um, more and more of these came out. So illustrations from the illustrated London News in 1862, when the Prince of Wales visited Egypt, and this suddenly made Egypt the most popular travel location for the Victorian English because the Prince of Wales had gone. That set this like earlier eras of, you know, you know, the grand tour of Europe, suddenly Egypt became the location because the Prince of Wales has gone. So, but you can also see um, these images from Frank Leslie's newspaper in 1856 of contemporary Egypt. Um, as well as the from the Sphinx, the Illustrated English Weekly, that um, actually was launched to provide information to these Victorian tourists. And you also see on the right um, a really wonderful illustration of the jewels of the Queen of a thousand years ago in the Illustrated London News. So you see this mix of you know images of contemporary Egypt with the romance of the travelogue and the romance of you know, here is jewelry that belonged to someone 1000 years ago and you can go to Egypt to see this. So um, here are some additional ones from the graphic um, as well as the excavations to, and um, from the 1880s and You'll notice in the central image that while part of that is an image of the actual excavation, and as the figures were found and then raised from the earth, you will also see many members of the public, Victorian tourists, there, you know, walking, picking things up off the ground, and bringing things home. Photography also had a huge impact on this. Uh, so the earliest photographs that I'm familiar with are these photographs of uh, the pyramids at Eat Giza. They're from the 1870s. These happen to be in the possession of the New York Public Library, um, as well as images of Karnak as it existed and the Colossus of Memnon. Um, so not only did you see these wonderful illustrated public, you know, published works, suddenly photography was bringing in these really photorealistic and photographic evidence that also caught people's attention. Um, this interest led to these grand displays of Egyptian design and Egyptian antiquity, um, in particular in Europe. So on the left, these are the Egyptian royal figures. None of these are actual antiquities. These are very romanticized recreations for these sorts of, you know, grand displays. So at the Crystal Palace in the 1850s, as well as um, in the 1860s, 
where they were bringing this reconstructed romance of ancient Egypt to London, to Paris, to New York, um, but not actually bringing necessarily the antiquities themselves. But then more of these world expositions and exhibitions promoted Egypt as a travel location. So the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876, um, Egypt actually had a display there. And this was the country of Egypt um, showing some contemporary as well as ancient works. Um, you'll see the Egyptian pavilion from the Paris World Fair in 1867. Um, but what you will also see here is that Egypt wanted to take, you know, part more in more in these expositions, but they were not economically able to at that time. So, for example, Cairo Street, the street in Cairo from the World's Columbian Ex Exposition in 1893, was actually privately organized Um along with the cooperation of the chief architect of the Committee for the Conservation of Monuments and Arabian Art, which was the official agency in Egypt responsible for preservation. And at, for this street, they actually created a full-sized replica um, of uh, one of the landmarks of Cairo's old city. So, um, here are some great images of the Victorians as they were actually traveling. Um, I particularly love the one on the right, the modern iconoclasts at work on the monument of ancient Egypt. You'll notice they're all women in their walking suits with their parasols and their hats. Um, whether they were actually part of any official archeological exploration or expedition, I don't know, but they were certainly dressed for the part. You see Victorians taking their well-dressed children to see um, the plaza, plateau at Giza and the Sphinx, as well as being led around on their camels. Um, and people might be familiar with the, still exists, the Thomas Cook Travel Agency. Um, Thomas Cook was a real person and he actually created a lot of the mechanisms for people to actually become tourists and take these trips to Egypt um, and created really tourism as a formal effort um, in terms of going to ancient, to visit the sites of ancient Egypt in modern Egypt. There is an ugly side to this though. Um, for example, um, you could take excursions to mummy pits where they would literally take pieces of ancient Egypt home with them. Some of them carved their names or initials into the stone. They sometimes destroyed hieroglyphics as part of their, you know, I was here um, inscriptions inside the monuments. Tourists smuggled mummies and mummy parts back to Europe. And it was very popular and very common to, uh, have these um, mummy unwrapping parties, as you'll see at the top right, where uh, a group of people are getting ready to open a sarcophagus and unwrap the mummy under view of the uh, ghost of the um, actual inhabitant of the sarcophagus. So these were very sought after souvenirs. And as you can see on the left, there is an invitation to a mummy unrolling where the mummy from Thebes is to be unrolled at half past two. So these were quite exclusive social events where they actually desecrated the bodies of ancient Egyptian mummies. Um, even worse though, um, is the picture at the bottom center. So mummies were actually ground down to make a pigment called mummy brown. And one of the ways they marketed this pigment was to capitalize on the fact that they had actually ground up actual mummies to include in this sort of ochre sienna, sienna pigment. So there really was an ugly, ugly side to this sort of tourism, unfortunately. But now we'll get more onto the topic of inspiration from ancient Egypt on to popular culture. So um, the first great design volume 
on the design emblems and icons and motifs of ancient Egypt is Owen Jones' Grammar of Ornament in 1868. So this is a work that actually introduced uh, designers, artists, artisans, architects to these beautiful design motifs. And this was an incredibly expensive work because of the very high quality color lithography uh, so that you could actually explore the various motifs, albeit out of context. Um, but you see here images of lotuses, images of boats, images of Egyptian fans um, that artisans and artists started to incorporate into their work. So let's look at art for a minute. So at the beginning of the 19th century, some artists uh, developed a style um, that we think of as romanticism. Uh, so depicting these romanticized versions of life. Um, in reaction to romanticism, there was another uh, school of artistry uh, called the academic school, which wanted to revive and study the classical techniques of the classical masters and do these create these very more precise and technical way where they would replicate the specifics of the not only the techniques, but as interpreted these interpretations of ancient Egypt. Um, many people are also then familiar with the Pre-Raphaelite movement um, just slightly after that, where this was an art where very serious themes of love and loss and regret um, were treated with maximum realism, um, mixed with a little romanticism, um, but especially on subjects from literature and poetry and a lot of images of love and death. All three of these schools embraced the theme of ancient Egypt. So you'll see on the top that truly romanticized version of Cleopatra on the terraces of Philae by Frederick Arthur Bridgman from 1886, um, Cleopatra by John William Waterhouse from 1888, uh, the more um, romanticized death of Cleopatra by the artist Juan Luna in 1881, um, and then one of the most um, well-known of all the academic paintings to actually feature an ancient Egyptian theme was the Pastime in Ancient Egypt by Lawrence Almatadema from 1864. So as the illustrated works and especially um, Owen Jones's work on the design of ancient Egypt became well known, you started seeing these interpretations such as these works of art, which then themselves were exhibited and that extended the reach of these themes and works. Um, so obviously it then started to have an impact on architecture. Um, one of my favorites, is this Egyptian house from Penzance in Cornwall of England from 1837, which is just, you know, you can see the influence of Owen Jones's illustrated work of Egyptian motifs because it's like he picked every single one of them and all of the colors to go with it. And it's a wonderful, you know, pastiche and interpretation of ancient Egypt. While also, if you look at the designs of the window mullions, actually bringing in some of the design of contemporary Egypt in the window designs. Um, you'll see at the top, the temple mill works in Leeds. That was the um, entrance to this mill. Um, the synagogue in Canterbury from 1847, where it featured not only obelisks, but an interpretation of the sort of massive scale architecture as was seen in many of the Egyptian temples. And then the Egyptian hall, which was in London, which later became known as Bullock's Museum, which also had this interpretation of, you know, the massive grand architecture of ancient Egypt. Um, on the bottom left, um, I'm sure that many people at various times have heard the prisons in New York City referred to as the tombs and not understood why they were referred to as the tombs. That is how they were originally constructed um, to mimic an Egyptian tomb. 
So there are the tombs uh, designed by John Haviland as they were originally built in 1838. Um, at the top, you'll see um, a building that I'm very familiar with um, from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. You'll see another image of the entrance to the Temple Millwork at Leeds. And at the bottom, um, you'll see how this started to also influence interior design. So it wasn't just about public works and public spaces. This started to then appear in you know, the private home personal spaces, such as this amazing Egyptian room um, from the Armour Steiner Octagon House. And it is actually an octagonal shaped house in Irvington, New York, which was built in 1872. And the frieze around the top um, um, of the um, ancient Egyptian pharaohs and workers um, underneath a starry sky. Um, as the starry sky is very, very much an authentic replication of the sort of sky that you would find in some of the Egyptian tombs that were being discovered at the time. Um, I can't talk about architecture and public architecture without talking about fraternal organizations. So on the left, um, you have a Masonic temple from Brussels, Belgium, from the 1870s. Um, at the top right, you have an Odd Fellows Hall uh, from uh, Plymouth, England, from the 1820s. Um, in the bottom, you have the Egyptian Room at the Royal Arch Masonic Temple in Sydney, Australia. And one of my personal favorites, um, and to many people who I see in the audience today who know that this is still in place, um, this is the Egyptian shrine um, that belongs at the, that still exists at the Rosicrucian Park and Museum in San Jose, California. So, you know, these buildings um, were made to mimic the um, architecture and design of ancient Egypt at the same time that they were also incorporating the Egyptian mysteries into their rites. So, um, like people are familiar, for example, with the Shriners, the Shriners interpreted, have their interpretation of other North African Moorish um, influences on their rites and their rituals. And I do call them rituals. Whereas many of these other organizations like the Odd Fellows and the Masons and the Rosicrucians, otherwise known as the Order of the Rosy Cross, have brought this sort of emphasis on the Egyptian mysteries and the role of ancient Egypt and the glory of Egypt into their architecture and their rites. And so the buildings had to then reflect the rites that they were actually creating for their organizations at the time. Um, in the Egyptian world, obelisks were very closely associated with the sun cult um, which is due to their height and to the pyramidal top that they consider reminiscent in design of the sun's rays. So the most famous obelisks from the Victorian era are not Egyptian revival, but are themselves actually stolen antiques. So Cleopatra's needles are actually a pair, a separated pair of obelisks from Alexandria in Egypt um, they were there obviously for over two millennia from the time that they were built to the time that they were dug up, taken away, and re-erected in London and in New York City in 1878 and 1881. So also, um, you'll see the Luxor obelisks on the right, which are a pair of obelisks that stood on either side of the portal at the temple of Luxor during the reign of Ramses II. Um, so in the 13th century BC, um, the right-hand obelisk from that entry was moved to the Place de la Concorde in France in the 1830s, as you see in this glass plate you know, image, um, while the other still remains in Egypt. So Egyptian revival um, architecture was not just about the revival, it was also so, some cases about bringing the actual objects to public display as public works. Um, we talk a lot about this in um, the, thinking about the um, 
the British Victorians, to a lesser extent, the Victorians in um, America, but this impact was everywhere. So um, you'll see on the left, um, the entrance to an, you know, a bridge in Paris. Um, on the bottom left, you'll see a tea room that still exists in the Czech Republic. And then more well-known, the Egyptian gate or the Sarcocello, which um, I wish that we knew who the architect was, but we don't, that is still standing in St. Petersburg, Russia, that was uh, built in 1829. So you see that this didn't just affect one area or the Western, you know, sort of the Western world, but was all over Europe and other parts of the world as well. So anybody that knows me knows that you're not going to hear me talk about um, influences of Egypt or any sort of culture on popular culture and architecture without having me talk about a cemetery, because people know I love a cemetery. Um, Highgate Cemetery um, in created in 1839, and the Kensal Green Cemetery in 1875 were both in London. So the Egyptian revival symbols and architectural styles that became sort of the hot new design motif were also then reinterpreted by Victorian architects um, in a way that they thought was um, applying them in the way that they were originally intended, because a lot of this work and came from, you know, the design motifs were from tombs and temples um, and public monuments. They became then applied to funerary architecture in the West. So it was obelisk shaped tombstones, pyramidic mausoleums, flat roof mustabas, lotus topped columns, sphinxes, winged orms, sun disks, snakes, all of this. So here you'll see both a contemporary image and a more current photographic image of the Egyptian gateway um, and the Western part of Highgate Cemetery. Um, and this is where you can really see that they created this great public entryway and passage through which you were associating these images of the Egyptian dead with death as it existed in the Victorian time. On the right, you'll see a truly amazing Egyptian revival tomb um, from 1875 that has um, the granite, it has the columns, it has the winged portico, and, um, and you'll see that it's also right next to an obelisk. So this was the Victorian's way of saying, we believe that this imagery in part comes from the dead, and we are now going to use it to memorialize our own dead in our cemeteries. Um, there were many cemetery gateways, grand gateways created this way. The first one in the United States was at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts from 1822. Um, you'll see the image of the gate that is there, and underneath it, you will see a piece of commemorative porcelain with an illustration of the gate at Mount Auburn Cemetery. So not only could you visit the gate, you could take home the porcelain tray with an image of it. Um, among the other earlier gates from um, United States cemeteries were the Granary Burying Ground, which is in Boston, and then the gate at the New Haven Cemetery designed by Henry Austin from 1848. So you can see the more widespread interpretation and use of these images and monumental scale as entryways into cemeteries. Um, they also obviously worked with a lot of this imagery, especially pyramids, um, to create actual monuments to families. So you have the, the Egyptian Revival Mausoleum that is from the Necropolis in Glasgow in Scotland, the Schoenhofen Pyramid Mausoleum, which is at Graceland Cemetery in Chicago, uh, the Monument to the Confederate Dead in Richmond, Virginia, designed by Charles Dimmock, and my personal favorite, a catalog showing mail order obelisks. So if you weren't going to work with an architect, you too could actually order an obelisk by mail and make sure that you have it for your family's monument. Um, 
some other really notable ones, the Winter Mausoleum in Homewood Cemetery in Pittsburgh with these amazing bronze doors, uh, the Tate Mausoleum at uh, Belfontin Cemetery in St. Louis, and the Illingworth Mausoleum, um, which is the Undercliff Cemetery in Bradford, West Yorkshire. And you see, you know, basically every single possible design motif together. You've got pharaohs, you have queens of Egypt, you have lotus, you have winged, you know, falcons, you have monumental architecture, you have sphinxes, you know, you have every possible, you know, bit of the motifs all thrown together to show their love and interest in the Egyptian. Sphinxes, sphinxes everywhere. Uh, the Sphinx at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, the Lawler Sphinx in Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati, the Peasley Sphinx um, at Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville, Kentucky. And my first exposure to this, the Lucian Brunswick Metairie Tomb at Metairie Cemetery just outside of New Orleans in Metairie, Louisiana. This is actually one of the first pieces of monumental Egyptian revival funerary architecture that I personally encountered. And that actually sort of spurred me to become more and more interested in this interpretation of ancient Egypt and Egyptomania. So obviously, um, as we saw in the Octagon House, that this work wasn't just about public works and public monuments and public memorials. It was the design motifs were coming into popularity as motifs um, in the home. So on the left, you will see a canopic jar. That's Wedgwood from the 1790s. The vase with pedestal that is a very interesting amalgam of Egyptian and Attic vase styles together. Um, the um, interesting ceremonial um, gift for Lord Kitchener that's um, in Darmstadt from the 1890s um, that looks to anyone who has ever seen the um, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, it looks a lot like the Lost Ark. Um, you'll see mantle clocks from Tiffany and from Société Clusienne. And one of the most interesting early pieces that I came across in, you know, Egyptian revival, you know, home decorative arts is this porcelain tea set, the tete-a-tete, -tete, the set for two um, from Vienna from the 1790s. Um, we're all familiar with um, Egyptian revival jewelry. Um, you saw in one of the earlier slides that they were actually, you know, the early illustrated newspaper articles and the travelogues included images of the items that were coming out of the tombs. And one of the items that came out of the tombs frequently was jewelry. Um, not only were they coming out of the tombs, but when our friends, the Victorians, were unwrapping the mummies, they were actually then extracting the funerary items, the ushapti, the scarabs, the jewelry that had actually been buried with the individuals in their mummy wrappings. So you'll see here um, a number of pieces ranging from the 1860s to the um, 1910s. Um, one of the more interesting pieces and styles that I wasn't familiar with until I started reaching, researching this talk is actually the necklace that's at the bottom left. That's not enamel. It's not painting. It's actually a micro mosaic. So very, 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 very small tessera put together to make these micro mosaics that are probably each one of them is no more than an inch high. And this was actually a very common technique for this sort of Egyptian revival jewelry of the time, where they thought we're not only recreating the style of the jewelry and the motifs, we're recreating the techniques for these objects and how things were, were had actually been created. Um, furniture, so much Egyptian revival furniture. Um, that amazing um, monumental desk, uh, uh, which is French from circa 1900. We don't know the maker or designer. Uh, the table, 
Um, the chair at top, William Holman Hunt, uh, a member of the pre-Raphaelite movement, who was instead of, in this particular case, trying to embody the medieval period as the pre-Raphaelites often did, is actually bringing in these sort of Egyptian designs into his work, um, as well as this amazing small scale children's chair from the late 1800s and this hall table, which is attributed to Padier and Stimas from the 1870s. Fancy dress. Can't have a talk to a group of costumers without talking about fancy dress. So, you know, unsurprisingly, this interest in um, all things ancient Egypt um, had an effect on fashion. I'll talk more about fashion uh, generally a little bit later when I talk more about their early 20th century. But um, as these romanticized images of um, ancient Egyptian women um, were depicted in say the pre-Raphaelite or academic or romantic paintings um, or in these illustrated travelogues or um, illustrated newspapers, it became of interest to actually dress like an Egyptian, but in this case, the most over the top Egyptian you could possibly um, imagine. So at left, um, there is the Honorable Mrs. Algernon Burke, as well as uh, Princess Henry of Pless at the Duchess of Devonshire's Diamond Jubilee Costume Ball from 1897, one of the most well-known and well-documented uh, fancy dress balls because the attendees were photographed. Um, you'll also see at the center top uh, Lady Paget's dress from 1899 from an illustrated from a um, fancy dress ball that she held. Um, at the bottom center, there were several publications at the time meant to help you choose your design for fancy dress. Um, I'm particularly fond of fancy dress described, um, but so here is uh, Le Mode Illustré, an image of um, three different types of fancy dress, uh, the upper left being musical, the upper right being sort of um, the milkmaid aesthetic, and at the center, full-on romanticized Egyptian pharaonic dress. Um, the one on the right was one that I had not seen. Uh, until I was doing this research that um, the um, Arabian Nights Ball in London, um, while some people came in sort of mostly Arabic and inspired work, on the left, there is someone who actually came as a sarcophagus. So I had never seen that before. And I cannot imagine, as some of us know from some of our own costuming, how that person ever sat down. Um, music, um, the, the, the mystery and beauty of ancient Egypt um, also had its effect on um, contemporary music. Um, most of us are familiar with the tragic opera Aida, which was comp composed by Verde, set to a libretto by Gizanzone. And this takes place in the old kingdom of Egypt and was actually, surprisingly to me, commissioned by Egypt. It was commissioned by Cairo's Opera House and premiered there in 1871. So this highly romanticized opera about life and death and tragedy in ancient Egypt was actually commissioned to be performed for the first time in Cairo. Um, then it gets a little sillier. So um, you'll see here from 1885, the from the highly successful Broadway one of The Wizard of the Nile, which was scored by Victor Her Herbert with a libretto by Harry Smith. It was so successful that it jump-started the composer's career. So this is a three-act comic operetta uh, that opens with Father Nile, Keep Us in Thy Care, sung by actors who were portraying Nile boatmen and water carriers. Um, it, you know, sometimes serious, sometimes less serious. Um, you'll see some set designs for the um, opera Octavian in Egypt or excuse me, a ballet Octavian in Egypt performed in Milan. Uh, costume designs of a wildly varying level of authenticity 
for the Opera Thais um, by Massenet from the Paris Opera in 1894. Uh, Caesar and Cleopatra, a play written by George Bernard Shaw in 1898. And this is an illustration of the two lead characters, um, which was then also novelized. Um, and one of my personal favorites on the bottom right is uh, Barnum and Bailey, um, the greatest show on earth. So um, actually having as one of their um, traveling shows, a traveling show with an Egyptian theme, the spectacle of Cleopatra. Um, literary effects, a lot of, you know, a lot of interesting literary interpretations. Uh, one of the earliest and still most famous is Percy Shelley's sonnet to Ozymandias, uh, which was published in 1818. Uh, he began to write the poem after the British Museum acquired um, this uh, head of younger Memnon, uh, which was a 13th century BC head and torsos fragment that is an from the Temple of Memnon, um, a depiction of Ramses II, and Ozymandias was the Greek name for Ramses II, and Shelley was so inspired by this work that he wrote the poem that we all know, I met a traveler from an antique land, my name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Um, popular fiction, uh, this went, you know, into all forms of popular fiction. The Mummy, a tale of the 22nd century. This is one that takes place, um, written in 1827, but takes place in the 22nd century where an ancient mummy is revived and uh, espouses its reactions to life in the 22nd century. And this, this is actually available. You can still read this. Um, the Mummy's Foot, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the meme of, you know, the, the revived mummy. Um, some works, Words with a Mummy uh, by Edgar Allan Poe, um, a mummy who was revived and um, the group had a lovely conversation. Um, Ed Louisa May Alcott, um, her Lost in a Pyramid or The Mummy's Curse, and I'll talk more about The Mummy's Curse. Uh, the Jewel of the Seven Stars by Bram Stoker. Um, as well as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's lot number 249, um, in which someone bids on a set of objects at an auction, lot number 249, and among the items that he acquires is a sarcophagus where its inhabitant comes to life. So many uh, authors that we think of now as quite serious literary figures like Poe or Louisa May Alcott or Bram Stoker or Conan Doyle were actually, you know, jumped on the bandwagon in terms of this highly popularized theatrical kind of literature about interacting with ancient Egypt and which then got fueled even further by the second wave of Egyptomania. So most of the works that we're, we've been seeing before are primarily from the 18th and early to late 19th centuries. So, you know, the literature, the music, uh, the artwork. The tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered in 1922, excavated by Howard Carter, funded by his patron, the Earl of Carnarvon. And this became a massive international media event unlike which anyone had seen. So you see the great Egyptian discovery, exclusive pictures from the Illustrated London News in 2022. You know, there is the image of, you know, Carter, you know, opening the great sarcophagus to see the gold inner sarcophagus of Tutankhamun inside. Um, the first image of the inside of the tomb with the burial artifacts. Um, this amazing illustration from the Saturday Evening Post of the inner gold sarcophagus for Tutankhamun and the really kind of glorious romanticized image of ancient Egypt um, published the same year in the Saturday Evening Post. So, you know, here are some of the images um, of some of the more well-known works from the, Tut the tomb of Tutankhamun. 
the sheer number and the quality of the tomb goods, especially the object, all the objects that were made or set with gold, made this a true sensation. Um, so the the image of you know young Tut, the amazing and beautifully you know still vibrant um, paintings on the walls, the jewelry, and of course the image of the face of Tutankhamun on his sarcophagus. So this then went everywhere. So for example, um, fashion, textiles, um, you'll see that Tutankhamun over blouse um, that was advertised from uh, Chisette, uh, the furnishing fabrics from Steiner and Company from um, England, this amazing Egyptian revival turban hat, uh, with the colors that have been come to sort of be associated with ancient Egypt, the gold, the red, and the faience blue. Um, this amazing embroidered dress, the robe de soir um, from Catalogue Drouot. Um, this um, dress made to look very much like the dress of a pharaonic woman from the um, Bradleys in 1923, and this truly amazing and beautiful embroidered Egyptian silk coat that's both appliqued and embroidered from the 1920s, because suddenly everyone wanted to not only have um, Egyptian style objects, Egyptian decor, they wanted to look like ancient Egyptians as well. Um, popular music, um, you think that the popular music went everywhere in the Victorian era, but after this, my personal favorite, Old King Tut was a wise old nut. At the Mummy's Ball, the Gypsha Foxtrot, Under Egyptian Skies, the Mystic Nile, and Cleopatra had a jazz band because, of course, Cleopatra apparently had a jazz band. So, you know, the uh, um, cap of the the many, many ways in which creative um, could actually capitalize on ancient Egypt covered every possibility. Um, for example, advertising. We have ancient Egyptian cognac, we have perfume, we have you know, the uh, palm olive, we have tobacco ads, and to me, most unusual, a 1923 advertisement for laxative, illustrated with a reclining Tutankhamun, because I guess Tutankhamun, you know, needed a little help from time to time. Um, literature, um, much the same, but in, you know, in some cases, very sensationalistic, like the Black Mask or the Kiss of Pharaoh, um, but in some case, much more serious and respectful like Social Life in Egypt or Laura Collins's Egypt. Uh, we get into the era of silent film now. Um, the earliest documented film that shows um, any actual documentary um, images of ancient Egypt was uh, La Pyramide Vieux General from 1897, which was actually a moving pan across the Sphinx and the pyramids at the Giza Plateau that was created by the Lumiere brothers, um, who are you know, well known to us as you know, icons of early cinematography and filmmaking. Um, but so you know, when we think of say um, early newsreels, here are the Lumiere brothers actually creating a sort of form of newsreel, a panned image of the plateau at Giza that was seen by, you know, probably tens or hundreds of thousands of people. Um, in 1998, Georges Méliès uh, created a movie short that was either called Cleopatra's Tomb or Robbing Cleopatra's Tomb. I've seen it both ways, which, you know, follows this theme of an archeologist accidentally releases the ghost of Cleopatra. Um, and you can see, um, you know, an image um, from that, as well as an image from of the monster, also set in ancient Egypt, um, where you can see, you know, what was probably, a, you know, a mummy uh, being raised again with this amazing, in front of this amazing stylized background. Um, 
Um, and the reanimation, of course, took place through an electric shock, which was also a new and somewhat frightening technology to many people at the time. So the idea that you could potentially reanimate a mummy using electric shock was completely plausible at the time. Um, You'll see on the right, uh, the most famous of the silent era Egyptian films, which is Thetabara's Cleopatra from 1917, which has a fascinatingly confusing pedigree, um, some of which is based on Ryder Haggard's um, King Hol Solomon's Mines and She, but also Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar, as well as his Anthony and Cleopatra. It is quite the confused plot, if you've ever seen it. But, you know, so this took from everywhere possible in terms of design, um, as you, and uh, as you see by her holding, you know, the Ankh and the image from the, um, of the dress, which is, has more to do with 1917 than it does with ancient Egypt. But that was true of many, many, many of these sorts of films. So, Two of the most, you know, sort of interesting and in some ways outstanding in many ways of the films were The Mummy from 1932, so the Boris Karloff uh, Mummy, and Claudette Colbert's Cleopatra from 1934. So, I mean, The Mummy for its, yet again, this theme of, you know, awaking an ancient evil, awaking a mummy, from you know ancient Egypt to menace you in the present, um, the cursed mummy, the mummy's curse, which I'll talk a little bit more later. Um, but the Claudette Colbert Cleopatra is one of the most astonishing spectacles that you will ever see um, in terms of the size, the scale of the sets, the truly amazing um, 1930s design applied to Claudette Colbert's outfits. Um, and if you have never seen it, if you, for example, only seen the um, later, you know, Vivian Lee or Elizabeth Taylor portrayals of Cleopatra, you've got to see this one, uh, which also includes Rex Harrison. It's actually a beautiful and astonishing movie. So as you saw in the design, for the Claudette Colbert Cleopatra from 1934, this was the era of Egyptian art deco. So the arts decoratifs, um, which came out of an exposition in Paris, um, was, you know, the reaction to, you know, you had the Victorian academic era, you had the more soft flowing art nouveau, of the late 19th and early 20th century, which moved then into the very stylized art deco, art decoratif of the 20s, 30s, and going in slightly into the 40s when it then transformed again into the modern, the streamlined modern style. But, you know, Egyptian, you know, art deco influences in it, um, Art Deco that was influenced by ancient Egypt is, there's so much of it. I mean, there's this amazing bookcase, this massive bookcase. Um, you'll see this bust uh, created by Ott and Brewer, a broom screen from the 30s, mantel clock, well-known glass artist, Emile Gaillet doing, you know, these sort of Deco lotus forms, you know, in glass. Um, the illustration by Georges Barbier on the right and at the top, favorite of many costumers, Erte, Romain de Tirtoff, and his depiction of the Nile from 1928. So you can see how they took these very brightly colored, very, you know, sort of geometric shapes, especially lotus shapes and the stylized shapes from ancient Egyptian murals, such as in the room screen, where the view is very flat. And so the clothing and the shape of the face and the shape of the you know, objects, as well as the hieroglyphs, really led themselves to this sort of interpretation in a stylized deco style. Um, and then you'll also see, you know, like in the mantel clock and in the bust, um, sort of the mix of deco and a little bit of Art Nouveau, you know, still coming through, where you have these just amazingly stylized, detailed 
while also geometric, very structured and often quite symmetrical works. Uh, this, of course, also uh, Egyptian Art Deco, very, very important in fashion in the 20s and 30s. Um, on the left, you'll see a catalog um, from France where you'll see these amazing drop waist, drop waist dresses and the women wearing the dresses and the headpieces as well as carrying stylized versions of ancient Egyptian fans. And behind them, they're actually standing in front of a stylized Egyptian mural. Um, you'll see this um, amazing Egyptian revival necklace, uh, 18 karat gold, cloisonne and diamonds uh, with the uh, Aris and the Lotus and the Ankh. Um, there's an Egyptian styled evening dress by the famous designer Paul Poiré. And what you see here is sort of a mix. It's not specifically an ancient, entirely ancient Egyptian, other than the um, snake shapes that are on her um, headpiece. But this is also, as you can see, was influenced by contemporary Egyptian textiles. So this was sort of a blend of contemporary Egyptian design contemporary French design and some ancient Egyptian motifs. Um, in the top center, you'll see an amazing pendant, uh, gold, diamonds, mother of pearl, um, also by Erte. Um, the Egyptian evening bag in the bottom center by Van Cleef and Arpels. Uh, on the right, um, this representation of uh, the goddess Sekhmet, um, meant to look like faience. Um, which is a glazed earthenware often used for not only scarabs, but Ushapti, but of course, surrounded by emeralds, rubies, and diamonds. And at the top right, the um, diamonds, um, emeralds, sapphire uh, um, necklace, as well as ear clips from Le Cloche Frere um, from the 1920s. Um, Egyptian Art Deco also, of course, you know, hugely popular in terms of architecture at the time, um, the Chrysler building in New York, um, we think of as a, you know, a true monument of Art Deco, but it absolutely had, for example, this is what a set of the elevator doors on the left, the lotiform um, Egyptian motif uh, mixed with Art Deco in the creation of the design on the elevators. Um, you'll see this entrance um, from a storage facility, um, now a store in Chicago from the 1920s, where you have, you know, everything from pharaonic images to monumental lotus topped, you know, columns um, and winged scarabs, um, but also some sort of contemporary Egyptian woodwork that you see around the um, frame of the doorway. Um, on the bottom, you'll see the Hoover building uh, from 1932. And you'll see that it's not only this amazing deco um, tile work that's over the door. If you look closely, you'll see this sort of Egyptian deco you know, design in the wrought iron uh, that's around the front of the building. The top right, that's the Egyptian house from Strasbourg in Germany, which was a collaboration between Franz Schrader, who is the architect, and Adolf Ziele, who was the muralist, who actually painted the work. And you'll see again that stylized deco interpretation of flat Egyptian murals and motifs. So, you know, the striding figure that we're so familiar with from Egyptian murals and the lotus flowers. Um, as well as the stylized waves of the Nile and the uh, lotiform columns next to it. Um, on the right, the Pythian temple designed by Thomas Lamb from the 1927 in New York City. This is actually still, uh, still standing. And you'll see the embrace of the um, uh, winged sphinxes, um, um, as well as the image of, you know, more of the Egyptian mysteries winged aris, uh, faience blue, snake images, and the repeated, you know, deco motifs. Um, this is um, a um, 
fraternal organization that I actually don't know anything about the the Pythias, the organization Pythias, but you know they obviously you know greatly also in a slightly later period than some of the other or fraternal organizations embraced the mysteries of Egypt. Um, theaters and picture houses. This was the area era of the grand, beautiful theater and picture house. So you'll see the Luxor Palais de Cinema from Paris that was designed by Henri Zipsy. You'll see the Egyptian theater in Delta, Colorado, um, designed by Montana Fallis in 1928. The Carlton Cinema in Islington, London, designed by George Coles in 1930. The, DeKal the Egyptian theater in DeKalb, Illinois, designed by Elma Burns. This is actually a theater that has been beautifully restored. So if you're ever in that area and interested in seeing a beautifully restored Art Deco Egyptian uh, revival theater, uh, the Egyptian theater in DeKalb is one of them. Obviously in the center, you'll see Grauman's Egyptian theater in Los Angeles. Um, and next to it, the Paramount Theater in Oakland, California. Um, these, some of these were designed by some of the same architects as um, created works that were um, like the Maya Theater, El Capitan in Los Angeles. So you had architects that were sort of embracing these um, ancient cultures. Um, this was also the era of a lot of Mesopotamian inspired architecture. Um, I think of the big tire factory um, in Southern California. Um, and they embraced this monumental design in these new theaters, especially the movie theaters and picture houses. Um, obviously the movies themselves also embraced this. You'll see the Vivian Lee and Claude Rains, Caesar and Cleopatra. Um, the um, Rhonda Fleming, Serpent of the Nile. And yes, there at the bottom right, that is Sophia Loren um, in an Italian sex farce called Two Nights with Cleopatra, in which Cleopatra has a double and they change places and seduce different men. So, you know, there you go. Um, this, of course, is well known to many of us, the 1963 Cleopatra with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, um, which um, embraced a very 1960s uh, interpretation of Cleopatra, um, for example, her hair, as well as some of the dresses, and these amazing large-scale numbers um, where they're wearing practically nothing and dancing in with great joy on top of these monumental floats. Um, I wanna also mention the bust of Nefertiti. Um, this is uh, a piece that had a lot of influence. Um, it was excavated at Amarna in 1912 by a German archeological team. Um, this is Nefertiti. Her name is pronounced many, many ways. I personally say Nefertiti, there's Nefertiti, Nefertiti, Nefertiti but I use Nefertiti. Um, and it is believed to have been sculpted by Tutmosis um, because they workshop where they found the work could be identified, identified as his. Um, the original owner of this piece uh, commissioned some replicas. Uh, they were not exact copies. They were made from artificial stones. Some of them were tidied up. And um, in fact, I actually uh, myself uh, own a copy of this. The picture on the bottom right was sold by Brentano's bookstore in the 1960s. My mother bought it when I was a child, and I still have it on my bookshelf today. But you'll see the influence of this design from, you know, advertisements for, you know, Cook's travel, um, in artworks, um, Awal um, Iriscu's um, piece Nefertiti, Black Power, uh, there was a mod for The Sims that had a must for bust of Nefertiti. You could build it out of Legos. There were Broadway revivals, um, but also Rihanna in 2017. Um, I'll only briefly talk about some of this. A lot of us are familiar with Athula Mythos and H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, there were certainly, they embraced um, started off by Lord Dunsany's works, The Gods of Pagana, and his um, Alhirath Hotep, The Prophet. Um, 
the Outsider with Nefren Kad, The Black Pharaoh, which is well known to people not only from these works, but from their more contemporary interpretations um, in the um, Charles Strauss's Laundry series, where the Black Pharaoh has returned to contemporary England. Um, you'll see Imprisoned by the Pharaoh, with the Pharaohs, which Lovecraft wrote for Houdini and was published under Houdini's name, uh, but also The Great God Nyarlathep from the Dream Quest of Undone Kadath, Dreams in the Witch House, Honor of the Dark. There was a great um, weird embracing of the mythos at the time. Um, I already mentioned the meme of the mummy's curse, um, that we had all of these mummies that were being revived by electric shocks, by opening their sarcophagi, by exposing them to light. But this came from a, an actual apocryphal story that um, an English um, lord named Sir Bruce Ingram in 25 acquired a mummified hand with a bracelet that supposedly was the curse of the mummy. And uh, cursed be he who moves my body, to him shall come fire, water, and pestilence. Allegedly, his house burned down, it was destroyed by flood, and that he got rid of it before pestilence could actually come his way. Um, this is also accompanied by the curse of Tutankhamun, saying, and which it's believed that so many people that were associated with the excavation died. Um, so this has shown up in popular literature and music all over the place. I'm going to end with Egyptomania in the 1970s. Um, in 1976, the Metropolitan Museum in New York City um, and Thomas Habing, who was the chief curator there, he's the creator of the concept of the blockbuster um, exhibit. Um, he launched this traveling exhibit of the treasures of King Tut. And it went, this also went everywhere. Um, so from jewelry to clothing, to uh, Steve Martin, to um, theatrical, to the uh, t-shirt, um, which you may or may not consider in the best of taste. But so Egyptomania has actually never really gone away. There are just these waves, especially with the more recent King Tut exhibit that went through about 15 years ago. So there will always be this ongoing um, emphasis and um, interpretation of ancient Egypt in popular culture. And that is where I am going to end today. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. There's not, no other questions right now. Wow. I haven't, I haven't found the right button to press to ask questions. Can I ask it in person? Absolutely. Is the Washington Monument Egypt inspired? Yes. It is. So um, there are actually two Washington monuments in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, the first is actually the George Washington Masonic Monument that's in Alexandria, Virginia, still stands just outside Old Town, Alexandria. Um, and this is one of those cases of um, a Masonic monument um, in the form of an obelisk um, honoring George Washington, who was a Mason, um, using this sort of, you know, Egyptian obelisk motif um, as a way of honoring him as a president as well as a Mason. And this was also carried forward when they built the Washington Monument um, on the Tidal Basin in Washington, D.C., where this is, uh, you know, a memorial to Washington, but also subtly to his Masonic activities. Um, yeah, I see um, from um, Guy in the chat, uh, menswear and men's jewelry. Um, I probably should have included more of that, but you are absolutely right uh, that there, um, if you think about, yeah, jackets, ties, hats, a lot of Egyptian revival um, in, um, interpretation in menswear as well. Um, I happen to focus on women's wear, but you're right. If I give this talk again, I will include more examples from menswear. Tell us about your collar. Ah, my collar. All right. So there's a, so um, there's a story here. Um, so um, people may or may not be aware that there is a steampunk convention that happens every, you know, around in November in Madison, Wisconsin, called TeslaCon, 
And uh, the theme of last year's TeslaCon was actually this ancient Egyptian Victorian theme with mummies and uh, walking suits and archeologists. And this is actually where I gave the talk for the first time. As I was preparing for this, I was actually, you know, looking for, you know, both um, especially vintage items that I could take with me. This is actually an actual Egyptian vintage collar. It's probably about, it probably dates to the 1970s when the Egyptomania of the 70s happened and then the Egyptians embraced the sort of recreation of these. Um, it is the beads themselves are actually dyed newspaper. Um, I, I know because a couple have fallen off and I took a look at them as well as the Fiant scarabs. Um, it's strung on metal wire and I had the opportunity to purchase that as well as the matching earrings, uh, but it was quite fragile when I received it. So I'm lucky that I have um, an amazing friend, Lisa Ashton, who is on the call, who is an amazing bead worker and also specializes in beaded collars. So I gave the piece to her and she stabilized it onto um, new fabric and backing, as well as putting the edge beading around the edge. So everyone, while it is a vintage piece, it has been stabilized and you know enhanced by Lisa's beadwork. Ah, so someone asked about public buildings in California with reclining lions. That's actually more of, um, there is also a concept of Mesopotamian revival. And you'll see actually quite a bit of that, um, like um, the Shriner, not the Shriner so much, that's more um, Moorish, but yes, you will see that sort of Mesopotamian revival, another form of not quite Egyptomania, but interest in the discovery of these monumental um, Mesopotamian works and um, cuneiform and everything having to do with the mysteries of Mesopotamia. And they actually created a lot of those buildings. Yep, as Betsy put, antiquity romanticized. That's absolutely what it is. It's the interpretation of um, these monumental works in a way that is romanticized um, whether it's Egypt, whether it's the neoclassical of the early 19th century, where suddenly everything in the Regency era was uh, Greco-Roman, um, and the Egyptian revival, the Mesopotamian revival, the Moorish influences also in the late 19th century um, in England. And I don't know why there was so much Mesopotamian revival in uh, California. But you'll see there's a there are two different sort of versions of the Sphinx. Um, more traditionally, you'll see the sort of more feminine Sphinx, and that is generally associated with Egyptian revival. And you will then see these striding male Sphinxes with very stylized headdresses. Those are the Mesopotamian revival Sphinxes. Is there any time when these kinds of trends were deemed illegal besides owning the actual true artifacts? No, I can't think of a, a, a way or time when these were um, actually, when it was considered illegal to copy a style. If it were ever illegal to copy a style, I think a lot of artwork and design and would not exist because there's always a lot of interpretation and inspiration. So there's no, I mean, I actually um, used to work with the US Copyright Office and there's no reason, all of these works are in the public domain if you think about it legally and it's in no way eagle, illegal to be inspired by them or copy them. And Davenport was asking, are there any translations, I'm assuming she means from the Arabic, of what the Egyptians thought about those Victorian tourists. Oh, they were, well, yes, there are, there are contemporary publications, um, some in English, some in Arabic, and they were a very, um, at that time, they were a very um, economically disadvantaged country. 
and they embraced the tourism and the tourist dollars that came with it. Uh, but yes, they were they you know, gradually became extraordinarily incensed to see so much of their cultural patrimony leaving the country. And I can think of several cases um, where the Egyptian government has pressed the case with various museums as well as private collections that they please return the items to Egypt where they believe they belong. This is very much um, the case that you see with England and the Greeks um, looking for the repatriation of the Elgin marbles to Greece. Um, that's an interesting case in that you could not possibly reinstall the Elgin marbles um, where they were originally installed because the building has deteriorated so much so they could never be reinstalled and seen as they were when they were stolen. Um, but the Greeks would still love to see them come back. Um, so, um, you know, to Guy's question, yes, they, oh yes, the British Museum and the Met, I mean, think of the Temple of Dender at the Met. There are a lot of the, you know, but it's, it's not, it's, it's all of these. Um, I think about um, one of their relatively recent cases where a large connect collection of Benin bronze um, objects from the Kingdom of Benin in Africa were actually repatriated successfully. And, you know, that was a real high point to see the recognition that there were cultures, you know, pre-modern, not ancient, but pre-modern cultures in Africa that created great works that should be repatriated to the area that they came from. Um, yeah, the Temple of Dendar was gifted but I, there are so many other objects there. Um, I also think about the, the Rosicrucian uh, Museum in San Jose, where I attended, I went there many, many times. Every Sunday afternoon after church, my mother would say, where are we going? Are we going to the museum or the planetarium? And I would always say the museum. She would always say the planetarium. If she won, the planetarium was first, and then second was the... Uh, Egyptian museum, but at the time, and I was unaware of this, almost everything on display at the Rosicrucian was a reproduction. Um, I found that out from someone that I later knew who was in the registrar's office there, and then they gradually took all the really spectacular reproductions off display and put out some of the actual objects. But, um, you know, let's see some of the questions. Um, are they making copies of these items before repatriating them? Not that I'm really aware of as a large scale activity. Um, and so, you know, we can actually take, you know, really astonishing high res images of works now, as well as doing 3D laser scanning. So, you know, as Betsy mentions, the, the Smithsonian is doing that. They have tens of thousands of items that they have actually done 3D scans of. And in fact, you can actually get those 3D scans in some or most or all cases and actually use them to 3D print reproductions. And this is a trend that's just really taking off the 3D scanning. You know, as in, you know, and to Phil's question about what's kept Egyptomania alive, um, I think, you know, there will always be this concept of the romance of ancient Egypt, the mysteries of Egypt, um, the, you know, the interest in the Egyptian book of the dead, in hieroglyphics, in the imagery. It is, it's never not going to be interesting. It's a fascination, you know, with this, these motifs and the way of life that is very, very distant from our own. Um, in ways that you know are still you know just the image of Rahana on the picture in front of it was either Vogue or Vanity Fair that in 2017 you have an international pop star dressing herself as Nefertiti, also to harken back to the blackness of North Africa, because there is, any a lot of people will be aware that um, there is a lot of acceptance of the blackness of Egypt and North Africa in general, but still a lot of opposition to the blackness of 
North Africa and Egypt. And keeping that emphasis alive through someone like Rihanna is as important a cultural statement as anything else. I don't know how I feel about Gal Gadot being the next Cleopatra, but I will withhold judgment until I see it. Um, could you stand up a little more so we can see your whole whole collar? Sure. So um, one of the things I actually also did for TeslaCon, and I did this for Lisa, who was teaching a beading workshop, is I, um, I personally do a lot of resin casting. And I have um, scarab molds um, taken from um, actually antique buttons. And I cast them in resincrete, which is a product that's sort of a little bit like plaster of Paris, but with resin in it. And it takes very, very sharp details. And if it's thick enough, it's very solid. I took high viscosity um, UV resin and I tinted it after many different um, uh, tests. I have blue ones and red ones. And so I now actually have a way to do my own um, interpretation and recreation of scarabs, both in the faience blue and the red. And that was a fun experiment. I have one other question. Why do you think it is that there hasn't been a move to revive the Egyptian language, um, given the interest in it in Egypt itself? I think part of it is that we don't know how it was pronounced. And that's always a difficult um, revival of a language um, like Sumerian, like, um, and um, contemporary Egypt has actually been more focused on retaining their use of say the Coptic language and um, Arabic and different forms of Arabic. And I think reintroducing a language that we have no idea how it was pronounced is a bit challenging. Are there any other questions? Well, if not, thank you so much, Leslie, for giving this talk. It's been fascinating and I've really enjoyed it. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you very much for inviting me, Phil. I loved having the opportunity to reprise this for another audience. That's great. So our next webinar is Screen Accuracy is a Myth, Creating Costumes Without Losing Your Mind with Johanna Mead. Johanna is going to provide examples of how costumes can look very different off screen. And she'll also discuss where you can most effectively expend your resources to duplicate the details that matter and when it's okay to compromise. She's a very experienced customer and has had to go through making these kinds of calls herself. So it'll be really interesting to get Johanna's perspective on that and also to look at some examples of why what's on screen looks nothing like what you see in person when you actually can view the costume and what can cause that to happen. So this is on April 14th, 2024, 1 to 2.30 p.m. Pacific time, 4 to 5.30 Eastern time. Check social media and also mailing lists for information on registering for that. And if you have suggestions for the next season of webinars, please send email to board at siwcustomers.org. Thank you very much all for joining us for the webinar today, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.